Hello, everybody. You're very welcome. We're the Prehistory Guys. I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. The Prehistory Guys, bringing you news from before stuff got messed up by people writing about it. <laughs> so true. In a nutshell. <laughs> That's it. That's all you need to know. Uh, yeah, as ever, bringing, bringing you old stuff. Um, so exciting, this. So much underneath the surface of this. Mm. And uh, hopefully you'll have your socks knocked off a bit by what we've got in store. What have we got in store? Where we, what we, what, Well, you know from the title, but give us an overview. Yes. Well, it's really interesting. Um, a lot of you might know about Must Farm. Uh, if you don't, it's... Uh, a Bronze Age site in Peterborough, uh, in Cambridgeshire. And uh, basically, well, it is popularly known as Britain's Pompeii because this collection of stilt buildings on uh, on a river, swampy area river, uh, there was a fire and it all collapsed into the water. And so the level of preservation is it's like nothing you've ever seen spectacular um yeah. and they have been excavating there for many years now and extraordinary amounts of, uh, of artifacts have been coming out not least of all things like an entire wheel uh, but pottery textiles textiles still mm. on the loom you know it, it's it really is a snapshot albeit a sad one in that it all burnt down but um but a snapshot of actual lives being lived you know i mean mm. um so even in terms of the analysis of uh, uh, of the site itself they know that it burnt down when it was it had only been standing for about a year and they know that because of the insects that they've excavated from the timbers that uh, that fell into oh, the water I see. as I didn't well know that. it's just yeah. fantastic um anyway the reason that we're talking about it now is that uh, a team of researchers have just been doing a big analysis of the 56 beads that were found at the site. And the story around these beads is very, very far-reaching. Uh, so there are glass beads, ceramic, amber, and mm. tin. Mm. Uh, so it's quite remarkable, really. I think that that's a, that's a reasonable overview, I think, there. We should probably... Now dig in. Do you, uh, you've got some uh, some stuff in front of you there, Mike. I mean, do you want to read some uh, of the? Yes, I, I've got the article, the the, the main article that uh, comes up if you do a search on uh, glass beads uh, and uh, must farm. I uh, just a uh, couple of things though. Uh, we wouldn't have this news now if it wasn't for the fact that just recently, uh, was it last month or the month before? that the full report from the Must Farm excavation has only just been published. Oh, boy, is it, and is it a report? There are 1,500 pages or, or thereabouts of it's general staggering. overview. Yeah. And the specialist reports from uh, how many chapters, I don't know, in those, those pages. And normally the mainstream media wouldn't pick up on the publication of a report like this but we're focused on on you know we're basically just focused in on chapter 17 here because yes. it contains the most extraordinary thing uh, and just a, a correction it was only excavated for two years 2015 and 2016 all the excavation all the stuff coming out the ground um was done within those two years and now when it's did closed they find down it? Do, you, do you remember when they found it um, I think it was uh, not long before that. I don't know, you know, how long after the discovery of the I misremembered. I do that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job I'm here to correct you, isn't it? <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, uh, article on um, the BBC uh, website. Uh, I'll put on the screen uh, where it's from and uh, who it's by. Uh, says, the glass used to create beads discovered at prehistoric settlement dubbed Britain's Pompeii was probably made in Iran, analysis has revealed. Wow, how about that? The finds were among a wealth of well-preserved items unearthed in a burnt-out 3,000-year-old village at a quarry in Whittlesea near Peterborough. A bit of qualification there, actually, uh, um, at a quarry. Makes you think rocks, 
uh, and 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 deep quarries with with uh, rocks and lorries and stuff. This is a a, a clay quarry of which there are many uh, around this area uh, for some reason because it got very good quality clay deep down. Um, in which there are many um, uh, uh, Jurassic fossils and dinosaurs and stuff like that. I digress. Um, <laughs> uh, amber, shale, siltstone, fiance and tin beads were also discovered. Uh, prehistoric jewellery expert Alison Sheridan said their survival at Must Farm was absolutely thrilling. They reveal the really cosmopolitan connections of Must Farm's residents, according to Dr Sheridan. Some of the beads must have been got from northern Britain and possibly even Ireland, while the glass came from very, very long way across the sea, she said. That's all I'm going to read for the, for the time being. But... <laughs> um, we have have we mentioned the date of the settlement? Late Bronze Age, mm. uh, eight hundred and fifty BC. So, and the beads or the glass is from Iran. Let that settle in for a bit, because um, that's the jaw dropping bit that uh, you know it takes a while to to settle in. I think. Well, four and a half thousand kilometres. It's a long way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, you do have to ask, uh, and it's a question that is asked repeatedly with these things: of uh, well, how did they come to be in, uh, uh, in in Must Farm? Did they travel by sea? Did they travel by land? Was it both? Uh, uh, was it a, a, a deliberate? You know, they were brought, or did they travel over even centuries? Uh, hmm. Don't know. So many questions. So many. Yeah, yeah, but. From what we know of uh, the mechanisms of trade going on, you know, around the Mediterranean, you know, and, and across um, at least southern Europe and central e Europe, that these things were travelling at a moderate speed, at least, and and uh, you know, the people were most likely, in my, I would guess, no. I have an idea that they've come from a really, really long. Know that they've come from a really, long, really long way away, mm. uh, and a, a lot of value would be uh, would be put on them. I, I think that's fair to say. Um, now, if we were, if if <laughs> if we were geniuses, we could speak to you of how they know. These uh, this glass came from <laughs> Iran mm. and uh, the Near East, uh, some bits from Egypt uh, as well, or just the one bead from e Egypt that they found. Yes, yeah. Um, so uh, unfortunately, that's not the case um, because the the scientific techniques that in use here are a bit esoteric to say the least, uh, and the analyses of the glass beads. Um, uh, and how they were manufactured. I mean, it, it is extraordinary to think that it is known to archaeology and to science the varying techniques for the, for glass production. You know, around about this time, a thousand years uh, BC in uh, the the Middle and, uh, and Near East. Uh, how do you go about discerning that? You must have enough data to go on. You must have enough glass beads to go on in the, in the first place. Um, well, actually, that's, that, it, it's worth pointing required. out there. You you saying that it's worth pointing out. And they did actually reference in the in, in this chapter the Aluburan uh, shipwreck, um, yeah. which uh, off the coast of Turkey, which sank in. Uh, so it's, it's significantly earlier, but it sank uh, late 14th century BC, and mm. uh, on the Aluburan shipwreck were 145 glass ingots and thousands of beads so clearly the trade in glass and jewelry was pretty thriving it would yeah. seem yeah extraordinary stuff i'll read a bit more um so believed to be home to 50 to 60 people and who knows you know whether this is the full extent of the settlement or, or, or not you know whether mm. this is just a part of it uh, the fire that destroyed it in uh, 850 BC is unknown. Uh, the settlement and its contents were preserved because it fell into silt in the river 
Uh, this included by far the largest find of glass beads from any late Bronze Age context in Britain, according to Dr Sheridan and co-author Julian Henderson. Professor Henderson, an expert in ancient technology at Nottingham, Uni Nottingham University, concluded the glass used to create 48 of the beads uh, most probably came from Iran, while the glass from the 49th bead originated from Egypt. There's also another little intriguing object, aside from the beads made of glass. It says mm -hmm. a 23 millimeter long, uh, that's 0.9 of an inch, teardrop-shaped glass object, to be, believed to be a byproduct of glass making, was also discovered. And Professor Henderson and Dr. Sheridan described it as without parallel, uh, uh, as without parallel from Bronze Age Britain. Uh, Dr. Sheridan, who examined the non-glass beads, was instantly struck by the amber bead because it was so fantastic that it survived at all, as normally amber will burn, she said. The slightly charred find probably came from Scandinavia and may have been made into a bead in Ireland. So apart from the uh, obviously very, very long way distance that the glass came from, we've also got other networks and connections Mm. Um, connecting the whole thing to uh, places, which well, I wouldn't like. That to is set another up really interesting piece to, there that or, you uh, uh, that you you said uh, at the end there that um, so this piece of uh, of Scandinavian amber, you know, or well, probably Baltic amber, that was probably made into a bead in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's travelled over there to have work done to it. And then it's come all the way back from Ireland to completely the opposite side of uh, of England. It's uh, it's yeah. a staggering uh, tapestry of journeys that these things have yeah. made. I mean, it breaks your brain thinking about you know applying these kinds of uh, networks and uh, and trade. Uh, the people over these distances. It's easy to imagine trade to the next town and the t town beyond that, etc. Et mm. And I suppose you could extend that into a, into into a network. Um, but you just wonder, where, you know, where does your imagination take you? Is there a awareness of how storied these pieces would be and what value they put on them? Because the big question mark that arises in my mind that previous to this discovery coming out, uh, I always kind of assumed we've got you know uh, wooden wattle and daub houses supported on stilts on wooden stilts of them being you know pretty ordinary for late bronze age dwellings aside from the fact that they're over water etc mm. mind you that's pretty common in the fens um, but i never put any particular status on it one can only assume i only assume maybe it's just me that uh, <laughs> stuff like this if you if it's must be have a story attached to him uh, and having come from such a distance must have been a very or the necklace you know that, that they made up mm. would be a very very high value object so that raises a question mark about the status of the people living in this particular mm. uh, these um, five buildings in, in the settlement um, it, you know puts a different complexion on it entirely even though a lot of the items that we know uh, uh, that uh, that have also been preserved in the building, to our eyes, are still pretty low order, if you see what I mean. They're utilitarian uh, stuff. Um, uh, and you know, we've got tools and the, the normal day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, just before we started recording, we were talking, Rupert and I were talking about the, uh, the wheel, the wagon. It must have been a, a, a wagon wheel that was... Uh, uh, yeah. found in there as well in the, yeah. in, in the stop. Uh, and that in itself is really fascinating because it is uh, you know the, so far as far as I'm aware it is just one wheel that they have found um, and that <laughs> that in itself raises questions clearly it wasn't a wagon that fell into the water because there's only one wheel um, so what well, was somebody making wheels at Must Farm and maybe that's what they were trading um <laughs> You know, who knows? Who I, knows? I half jokingly suggested, well, you take your wheel off your wagon to stop it being stolen. Yeah, but it's the not more a silly thought about suggestion. It, the more, oh, hang about it. That's probably good. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Probably you know, we still do it now, don't idea. we? We take the wheels off our bikes when we tie them to lampposts. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's yeah. it is it's an interesting thought but um but you know you you do have to wonder you know on a slightly more serious note that you you mentioning the you know the the potential value of these beads you know anything that has come that distance in this period of uh, history that i mean wow what stories they would tell and how highly prized they must have been mm. so either uh, this is a high status group of people who can afford these things or th what they were offering was uh, equally uh, a high value and yeah. and worthy of that sort of exchange you know it could be either way couldn't it um, now the good news is i mean uh, as uh, the uh, antidote to us not knowing a lot about how it's just <laughs> how it's worked out that the glass comes from Iran. The good news is that we know a person who does. Yes. Or we know people who, who do. Uh, and um, luckily for us, we actually know Dr. Sheridan. Um, Dr. Yeah, uh, Alison Sheridan. Alison's uh, a good friend. become a good and, friend. Uh, <laughs> we messaged yeah. Alison. And we said, Alison, hmm. we're, uh, we're, we want to uh, talk about the, the, uh, the findings on the beads at Must Farm. Uh, would you come yeah. on and chat about it? And she replied saying yes within minutes, <laughs> uh, she, she said, um, and, uh, and gave us Julian Henderson's uh, email as well to ask him. So we get, we're going to get them both on. Brilliant. Um, so if you're yeah. interested in this and uh, finding out more about this, uh, do look out for uh, something coming in the next uh, few weeks, I guess, to further illuminate uh, mm. what's been this aspect of what's been going on at, at Must Farm. I tell you what, to cover Must Farm pro uh, pos pro properly, we'd have to open, start another YouTube channel on it, really. To, to do it justice, yeah, it's to true, it we really would. Uh, yeah. And I must admit, I've been thinking for ages now that we really should get Mark Knight on as well, who uh, Mark has sure. been the head archaeologist at Must Farm for a long time. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is just... Uh, there's so much there, you know, because it, it isn't it ironic that there was a fire and this whole thing collapsed into uh, uh, into the water mm. and was completely preserved. But it's it's nigh on certain that well they probably rebuilt pretty much straight away, probably rebuilt and not far away could have been just a little bit uh, down the water from where they'd had the fire. And yeah. that, because of the natural scheme of things, mm -hmm. and everything that they made afterwards has long since disappeared from yeah. the archaeological record. It's just this frozen moment in time that still remains. Mm. It's just wonderful. I think the site came to light in the quarry um, because the only remaining upright bits uh, of the settlement were the upright uh, palisades, the, 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 the uh, poles of, of the palisades. Uh, if the palisade hadn't been there, I wonder if it might have been sort of just missed, uh, yeah. overlooked or missed. I don't know. Mm. But anyway, that's what stopped the work. So interesting, uh, um, you know, uh, <laughs> it's the, it's the um, stress between industry and, uh, and archaeology. <laughs> you know, uh, this wouldn't have been found without the industry, without the, the quarrying. And, uh, uh, and yet the... the Archaeology has to be completed in two years, <laughs> uh, I suppose, for the uh, uh, industry c to continue on its way. Stay anyway, on. I think uh, we've probably said enough uh, for the time being. Unless there's anything you've got to add there, I think uh, it's time uh, to... Uh, no, I, I think that that's, um, that, that's enough from this little section, and, uh, and we mm -hmm. will keep your eyes out. Uh, we, we will have that interview with uh, Alison and mm -hmm. Julian uh, in the not too distant future, and yeah. uh, uh, you know, and they've been working. They've both been working, you know, hands on this. So, uh, so they'll have mm. a lot to tell us. It'll, It'll be, be good to hear from yeah. them what they've got to say. Mm. Thanks, uh, as ever, for watching, for tuning in, folks. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe. It all helps enormously. Do have a look in the description below. Follow the links to our uh, Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge project. Uh, and do consider becoming a patron uh, of ours because it, um, it all does help the, uh, the boat go faster. Um, 
Yeah, not to, not to mention the benefits, of course, of becoming a patron. I won't expand upon that now. <laughs> Follow the link down below. Okay. Cheers for now, folks. Thanks, Thanks a lot. See ya.